Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining in. I, Rama Patel, Director, Crystal Ratings Limited, welcome all of you to the Crystal webinar on Ratings Roundup, covering second half fiscal 2022. Today's event will have a presentation followed by a Q&A session. Our speakers for today's webinar are Somsekar Vemuri, Senior Director and Head, Ratings Criteria, Regulatory Affairs and Operations, Crystal Ratings Limited. Krishnan Sitaraman, Senior Director and Deputy Chief Ratings Officer, Crystal Ratings Limited. We also have with us Subodh Rai, President and Chief Ratings Officer, Crystal Ratings Limited, who will join us for the Q&A session. I would also like to highlight that the webinar is being recorded. I will now hand over to Som and Krishnan, who will take you through the presentation. Over to you, Som. Thanks, Oma. Good afternoon, everyone. I extend a warm welcome to all of you who have joined for this webinar on the ratings roundup of second half of fiscal 2022. The presentation here is a part of our efforts to highlight credit quality trends that we are seeing in our portfolio and the credit quality outlook that we have going forward based on an analysis of the rating actions on an active portfolio of a large number of over 7,000 companies. India Inc. is clearly living in interesting times with what two years of pandemic, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, and the crude oil prices crossing $100 per barrel. The businesses have emerged stronger and adapted fast to not just living with the virus, but also thriving in the new normal. Since our last webinar of ratings roundup, which we did in October 2021, outlook on credit quality continues to remain positive with upgrades continuing to outnumber downgrades. And in terms of our expectation as well, we expect upgrades to continue to uh, outnumber downgrades in fiscal 23. We will talk about this more in the slides to follow where we will present to you a snapshot of the rating actions that we have carried out in the second half of last fiscal and also the outlook that we have for credit quality for India Inc. in more detail. So moving on to the next slide. So Crystal's credit ratio, that is the ratio of upgrades to downgrades, increased to 5.04 times in the second half of fiscal 22, as against 2.96 times that we saw in the first half. The increase in credit ratio was in line with our positive credit quality outlook stance that we highlighted in the last ratings roundup. At 15.4%, the upgrade rate, which is nothing but the number of upgrades that we have done in this half, vis-a-vis -vis the number of ratings outstanding at the beginning of this half, was marginally higher than what we witnessed in the first half. But the downgrade rate was much lower at 3.1%. It was lower than, in fact, even less than half of the average of 7% that we have seen in the past uh, 10 half-year periods. With sustained improvement in demand, which has lifted most of the sectors to pre-pandemic revenue levels, secular deleveraging of balance sheets by issuers that continued even during the pandemic, and the proactive relief measures by the government, which helped in cushioning the pandemic blow, the credit ratio has inched upwards. The timely interventions by the government and the regulators, which include moratorium on debt servicing, ECLGS, resolution frameworks under both OTR 1 and OTR 2, relaxation of default recognition norms by SEBI, all of these have contributed towards cushioning the firms uh, from uh, the cash flow pressures and, and provided protection against them from the downside risk. Now, moving on to the outlook that we have for India's credit quality. Uh, we have uh, an outlook which is positive and we expect uh, rating upgrades to outnumber rating downgrades in fiscal 2023. This is driven by the demand drivers which are expected to sustain and the strong balance sheets which are likely to continue going forward. Nevertheless, there are some caveats in order. With broad-based recovery to uh, pre-pandemic levels and new risks which are emerging, such as the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, we have introduced a new framework, the Corporate Credit Health Framework, 
which looks at the credit health of key sectors on the basis of two aspects, the operating cash flow strength and the strength of the balance sheet in terms of the estimated gearing levels in fiscal 23 and the change in gearing vis-a-vis last fiscal. Some of the key conclusions that we have uh, from, from this study are that 15 out of the 40 sectors, which account for 16% of the total rated debt under our study, are in the most buoyant bucket in terms of credit quality outlook with favorable uh, expectations in terms of the operating cash flow strength as well as robust balance sheet in fiscal 23. The balanced 25 sectors, which account for roughly about 84% of rated debt, are expected to have positive to neutral credit quality outlook with favorable uh, trends in at least one of the factors, which is either the operating cash flow strength or on the leverage side. Net-net, 36 out of the 40 sectors are expected to see improved or steady kind of operating cash flows in fiscal 2023. And interestingly, most of none of the sectors in our study are expected to show unfavorable trends on both the fronts of operating cash flow and leverage. What I would like to highlight here is that we do expect credit ratio to moderate going forward as persistent inflationary trends uh, especially uh, exacerbated on account of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, the winding back of some of the uh, government relief measures create headwinds for demand and profitability across sectors. Further, with offices opening up and business travel coming back, some part of the cost savings that we have seen in the last couple of years is also likely to be eliminated. Another risk to our, key, uh, to our credit quality outlook is any new COVID variant which could dilute the benefit of vaccination uh, leading to any uh, lockdowns. While this is something which we do not anticipate at this juncture, since COVID is not uh, is only down but not fully out, uh, continues to remain uh, a risk factor. Now, moving on to the outlook that we have for the financial sector. We have a stable outlook for the financial sector for both the banks as well as for the non-banks. With the corporates on a stronger footing, Financial sector today is much better placed in terms of resilience, uh, where both the banks and the non-banks have strengthened their balance sheets over the last couple of years. And we expect the financial sector to capitalize on the growth opportunities uh, which are on the anvil, such as increased infra spends, private uh, capex uh, happening in uh, some pockets, and incremental working capital demands which are likely to emerge, especially given the higher uh, price in, uh, for, for various uh, commodities. Banks are far more resilient now on account of better asset quality, higher capital buffers, and improving profitability levels. For the banking sector as a whole, we expect the credit growth to pick up to about 11 to 12 percent in fiscal 2023, uh, from around 9 to 10 percent in the previous fiscal. Even from an asset quality uh, metrics point of view, These are showing an improving trend. Overall, gross NPAs in the banking system are expected to reduce to about 5 to 5.5% by March 23, uh, from a level of about 7.3% that we saw at the end of fiscal 21. This is on the back of better cash flows for the borrowers, given the broad-based recovery and growth that we are seeing uh, in the economy. And also, uh, in part, contributed by the transfer of uh, legacy NPAs to the national ARC. Uh, which is which is uh, going to happen over, over this fiscal and the previous fiscal. However, concerns around the MSME portfolio uh, continue to remain, given that there was a higher share of restructuring that has happened uh, in the MSMEs, and M- the MSME sector has taken a disproportionate impact uh, of, of, of the pandemic. NBFCs too have shown resilience over the past couple of years and have navigated multiple COVID waves uh, amidst the adaptiveness of the sector. After seeing decadal low growth in fiscal 20 and 21, NBFCs are expected to ride on the tailwinds of the improved macroeconomic uh, fundamentals and strengthen balance sheets. And we are expecting a growth of about 8 to 10 percent in their AUM in fiscal 23 up from about 6 to 8 percent growth that we have uh, like we have seen in fiscal 22. Even in terms of the reported gross MPS, while there was some deterioration in the reported numbers in the December quarter following the RBI's classic, uh, clarification on NPA recognition and upgradation norms, the underlying asset quality metrics however had shown an improvement even then. 
Now with RBI deferring the implementation of upgradation norms till September 22, uh, we uh, we are likely to see a sharp turnaround in the asset quality in the near term for the NBFCs as it allows them adequate time to realign their processes with the uh, changing regulatory environment. Now, with this backdrop, uh, we will present the analysis in terms of our credit ratio, debt weighted credit ratio, and elaborate on our expectation for uh, some of the sectors in fiscal 2023. Moving on to the next slide, credit ratio has shown an increasing trend in the last two halves. After the low, which we've seen at the beginning of the pandemic, where credit ratio came at a low of 0.54 in the first half of fiscal 21, uh, it has continued to increase. And now in the second half of uh, fiscal 22, we have seen it stands at about 5.04 times. There were 569 upgrades and 113 downgrades in the second half, contributing to a credit ratio of 5.04. With While the upgrade rate has increased somewhat to about 15.4% in the second half, from about 12.5% that we have seen in the previous half, the downgrade rate declined to 3.1% uh, from a level of about 4.2%. This is something which we will discuss in uh, more depth in the following slides. The debt weighted credit ratio, where we are looking at the debt on the books of the companies which have been upgraded vis-a-vis -vis the debt on the books uh, where we have seen downgrades, that has declined somewhat to about 7.56 times in the second half uh, and from about 13.83 times in the first half. In fact, the 13.83 was on account of upgrades of a few large corporates that happened uh, in, in the first half. Now, moving on to the next slide. So, we have seen that the downgrade rate is something which, which has declined sharply, even as the, the upgrade rate remains elevated here. Uh, if, when we look at the downgrade rate, it's about 3.1% and is much lower than what we have seen historically. The Historically, uh, if you look at the last 10 half-year periods, the, the average downgrade rate was about 6.5%. And what we saw in the second half is less than half of this uh, average that we have seen in the past uh, 10 years. The key drivers for the buoyancy in the credit ratio include sustained domestic demand, upswing in exports, and the government push on CAPEX. Moving on to the next slide. We saw a, a recovery in uh, a rebound in, in demand across most sectors which have either reached or even surpassed the pre-pandemic levels. Nimbleness in managing supply chains and a tight leash on costs have also showed up the operating cash flows across sectors. When we look at uh, crystal rated portfolio uh, of uh, almost 5,000 odd companies, we, it, it indicates that the median operating profit has improved by about 15% over the past two fiscals, that is 2022, over the pre-pandemic uh, year of uh, fiscal 2020. In fact, when we look at just the companies which have seen upgrades in the second half, there was a much sharper increase in the median operating profits uh, of about 41% in the same period. When we look at uh, other aspects uh, in terms of uh, the, the fortunes uh, for, for the corporates, essentially, if you look at exports, they've crossed an all-time high of 400 billion in fiscal 22 uh, due to the sharp rise in consumption across the uh, key trading uh, partners uh, of India, especially US and Europe. Further, the growth also received a flip uh, from the government's thrust on infrastructure pen, uh, spending as evidenced by the gross fiscal uh, fixed capital formation uh, rising by about 15% uh, in, in fiscal 22, even as uh, the private sector capex was largely uh, muted. The other aspect on the next slide, which we would also like to highlight, is the secular trend in deleveraging that we have seen on balance sheets. First, when you look at the uh, graph on the left-hand uh, side, where we are looking at uh, both the median gearing as well as the interest coverage ratio, the median gearing is estimated to have declined to about 0.55 times uh, at the end of fiscal 22, from a level of almost one uh, about four to five years back, while we have seen interest cover improve about 4.14 times in fiscal 22. This effectively shows us that uh, the, the balance sheets have secularly strengthened over a span of time, which has improved the financial flexibility of the companies and have uh, uh, helped them cushion the impact of the pandemic, uh, rather thrive also in, in, in these uncertain times. We've also seen a strong run of equity issuances uh, that, which have also uh, helped these corporates uh, to strengthen the balance sheet, which is uh, depicted at the, the graph at the bottom. 
Other aspect which has come in is in terms of uh, the various relief measures that the government and the regulators have announced, uh, which which uh, ensure that uh, the, the pressure on the credit profiles was kept in check. These include loan moratorium, deferment of asset classification norms, the TLTRO operations, the emergency credit uh, guarantee uh, link schemes, where uh, almost uh, we, we, we see that 3.2 lakh crore has been sanctioned. And almost 95% of that money has gone towards the MSMEs. And, and the resolution frameworks, uh, OTR 1.0 and OTR 2.0, these were all various forms through which there were uh, interventions uh, done by the policymakers, the government and the regulators that cushion the impact uh, on, on the cash, uh, on the credit profiles of uh, uh, various companies, especially the smaller companies which were uh, facing cash flow pressures. Now let us uh, move on to the credit quality outlook that we have for fiscal 2023. 20, uh, and before uh, looking at uh, the credit quality outlook, I think it is important for us to spend a little bit of time trying to understand the macroeconomic perspective. On the macroeconomic front, our estimates for real GDP growth stand at about 8.9% for fiscal 22. And for 23, we are forecasting GDP growth of about 7.8%. This is led by demand drivers sustaining amidst widespread vaccine coverage, the gains that we are likely to witness from the supply side reforms and the robust export growth that we anticipate, especially on the back of the China plus one uh, strategy that is being uh, adopted by quite a few of the Western uh, countries. In addition, the, the support that we are uh, expecting from the government in terms of the uh, long deferred CAPEX uh, projects uh, uh, is, is likely to likely to also uh, be supportive for, from a growth perspective. The government's policy on CAPEX and infra spending is likely to push growth and PLI scheme is also something where we anticipate uh, some degree of uh, uh, support towards private CAPEX in pockets. The downside risks, however, uh, are coming uh, on account of the inflation where we are expecting about 5.4% in fiscal 2023. Uh, and Russia-Ukraine war front is also something which is only uh, contributing to higher uh, commodity prices, especially the crude oil. So uh, uh, inflation could uh, hit us uh, in a couple of ways. One, it could uh, it could be something which could uh, constrain the demand. And two, it could also constrain the operating profitability uh, or the margins uh, across a variety of uh, sectors. So both these uh, fronts, uh, you know, there could be uh, pressures which, which uh, are, are likely to be there. So uh, let us now turn our attention to what it means from a credit quality uh, perspective. So we uh, we do uh, have a positive outlook uh, for, for overall credit quality and we, we continue to anticipate uh, upgrades will outnumber uh, downgrades. When we look at the demand, this is something for most of the sectors, almost 90% of the rated debt, which we have uh, looked at, uh, the demand has recovered to or even surpassed the pre-pandemic uh, levels. And government's policy thrust via CAPEX and infra spending is something which is also uh, uh, playing a fairly supportive stance. Exports, something I mentioned, uh, have also uh, been fairly robust, uh, partly on account of the China plus one sourcing policies uh, of the developed economies, even as slowing global growth could pose some headwinds uh, from an exports perspective. And uh, from a balance sheet aspect, uh, you know, we, we expect the secular deleveraging trend is something which is likely to sustain as most corporates are still waiting for utilization levels to improve before embarking on fresh capex. The cautionary stance on the credit ratio uh, comes in uh, in the form of the inflationary trends that we are seeing uh, because of rising commodity prices. And that is something which is uh, likely to uh, result in moderation of the credit ratio somewhat. Now, uh, let's move on to the next slide where we, I would like to talk about the corporate credit health framework, our, our proprietary study on, uh, on, on corporate credit quality, especially now with COVID-19 uh, entering the endemic stage and new risks uh, in the form of ongoing war in Europe emerging, we have transitioned to a new framework to outline uh, credit quality outlook across sectors. So this new framework, corporate credit health framework, covers top 40 sectors by revenues and accounting for over 70% of crystals rated debt in the non-financial corporates. This study focuses on three aspects. The first one is a balance sheet strength, which is categorized as very strong, strong, 
and moderate based on a combination of estimated gearing levels in fiscal 23 and the change in gearing uh, which we are anticipating uh, this year. The second one is operating cash flow strength measured by a growth in EBITDA. A growth of uh, more than 10% is considered favorable. A growth less than 10% is considered moderate and a decline in EBITDA is something which is considered unfavorable. And the third aspect we are considering in this framework is a vulnerability of the sector to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Now, let's look at uh, the bubble chart that we have uh, on, on, uh, on, on this uh, slide. So let me explain uh, this chart first. The x-axis denotes the balance sheet strength. The y-axis denotes the, the operating cash flow strength in the form of EBITDA growth uh, in fiscal 23 or 22. And the color of the bubble here represents the, the impact of Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis on sectors, where red color in, indicates negative impact. Uh, amber uh, impacts, uh, reflects a moderately negative uh, impact and gray uh, color in, in indicates a neutral impact uh, on cash flows in the first half. Then the size of the bubble here uh, represents essentially the, the total quantum of the rated debt. Just for example, if you look at a sector like pharma, which is uh, you know uh, colored amber, uh, denoting a marginal impact uh, uh, as its export to Russia and Ukraine are currently exempt from sanctions and overall exposure of the Indian uh, pharma companies to these geographies is fairly low at about only 3% of the total exports. Further, since pharma is uh, expected to demonstrate healthy operating performance and has very strong balance sheet, it is a sector which we have uh, placed in the bottommost, leftmost part of the chart here. On the other hand, when you look at diamond polishers, uh, this is something which has a, a red color as trade and banking linked sanctions on Russia are likely to impact the sector's uh, sourcing of raw materials such as rough diamonds. And continued disruption of trade can make rough cost there, uh, leading to a squeeze in the margins in fiscal 23. Now let us come to uh, uh, the overall uh, conclusions uh, from the study in the next slide. Uh, so out of the 15, uh, uh, out of the total 40 sectors, 15 sectors, which represent about 16% of the total uh, rated debt, are uh, sectors which are showing most buoyancy in trade quality outlook supported by favorable cash flow strength as well as robust balance sheet. Sectors such as pharma, healthcare and IT uh, will benefit from uh, healthy demand and sectors such as specialty chemicals, auto components and electric components are likely to benefit from diversified geographical and revenue profile. The remaining 25 sectors uh, are, are expected to have favorable trends in one of the two parameters and hence are likely to have a positive and neutral credit quality outlook, though the buoyancy may be tempered compared to the first bucket uh, which, which, we, which I just talked about. Among these uh, 25 sectors, there are 19 sectors accounting for about 63% of the rated debt uh, where we are uh, likely to witness moderate improvement in uh, operating profit, uh, while the balance sheet strength is something which is likely to be robust. And these include uh, investment link sectors such as construction, industrials, real estate, or uh, th those which are consumption driven such as FMCG, sugar, gold jewelry, meat and poultry, etc. Net-net, 36 out of the total 40 sectors are expected to see operating cash flows increase or remain stable. While for the remaining four sectors, which are steel, diamond, oil, and uh, gas marketing and cement, which account for about 20% of rated debt, we are likely to see operating profit uh, decline, even as balance sheets are likely to play a supportive role. Let us now uh, turn our attention to the financial sector, and I would uh, like to hand over the presentation to Krishnan to talk uh, more uh, about financial sector outlook. Over to you, Krishnan. Thank you, uh, Som. A very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope uh, you and your loved ones are safe and in good health. Uh, turning now atten attention to the financial sector, let us start with our views on the banking sector. Uh, we expect banks to register an overall credit growth of 11 to 12 percent in FY23, uh, which is seen in the top chart. Uh, from a segmental perspective, which is shown in the bottom chart, uh, corporate credit, the largest segment for banks at around 40% of total credit, is expected to see the sharpest turnaround after uh, subdued growth in recent years. Now, we are seeing signs of a shift here uh, to a higher grade, uh, growth trajectory uh, in the corporate credit segment, uh, driven by project pipeline in the infra sector, uptick in private sector capex, especially through uh, the PLI scheme uh, in various sectors. And, of course, additional working capital demand is also picking up. So due to these factors, uh, credit growth in the corporate segment uh, for fiscal 23 should be uh, around double that of fiscal 22. 
Uh, then coming to retail credit, we expect that to continue to show healthy mid-teens growth, and that would be broad-based across uh, various uh, sub-segments. Let us now look at the asset quality picture. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, firstly, we see that on the left side chart, overall NPAs are expected to go below 6% by March 23, uh, from what was 11.2% uh, five years earlier. Uh, and, and the red box uh, indicates the percentage of the restructured book uh, as of December 21. Overall for banks, this is around uh, 2.5%. On the right, uh, we are showing a segmental asset quality trends. And I'll touch upon two segments here. Firstly, the corporate uh, credit segment, uh, which is where we continue to see the sharpest improvement uh, with uh, gross NPAs coming down uh, from what was 16% as of March 18 to an estimated 3.2 uh, to 3.4 percent as of March 23. Uh, here we have analyzed a significant portion of the corporate portfolio of the banks, and we are not uh, expecting any material uh, incremental stress or slippages there. Now, credit quality of corporate India is also reflected uh, in the Crystal Ratings credit ratio of upgrades to downgrades, which uh, came in at around 5.04 times in the second half of fiscal 22, which uh, Soam has already highlighted. <laughs> One point I'll add here is that uh, along with the fundamental improvement in corporate balance sheets and uh, business landscape, uh, we, uh, the decline in corporate NPS also factors in uh, transfer of legacy NPS to the national ARC, uh, which we are expecting to happen to the extent of around 90,000 crores in the current fiscal. The next segment I will pick up uh, is the MSME portfolio. Uh, this segment has uh, seen relatively higher restructuring of about six odd percent in the aftermath of COVID. And the performance of this portfolio as it comes out of restructuring will need to be seen. Now for fiscal 23, uh, this could result in an uptick of around 250 basis points in the gross NPS for the MSME segment. Uh, moving ahead, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, here we will touch upon how the improvement in earnings is also contributing to the overall resilience of the banking sector. On the left chart, uh, we see uh, the uh, profit after tax and uh, return on asset uh, trends, uh, which clearly show an improving trajectory. At an estimated 0.9% ROA for the system as of FY22, the profitability is higher than what we have seen in the last nine years. And that is driven primarily by public sector banks who turned profitable for the first time in five fiscals in FY21. Uh, on the right chart, we see how the provision coverage ratio and net NPAs have been improving over time. Uh, we see that the PCRs have improved uh, to around 70%, uh, which has uh, contributed to strengthening the balance, uh, ba balance sheets of banks. So with asset quality improving and the profitability also rising, uh, capitalization levels are also looking better. Uh, the bank's credit profiles are looking more resilient now than uh, what we have seen in the recent past. And we have a stable credit quality outlook for banks. Let's move to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, now moving on to what we are seeing in the NBFC sector. Uh, here again, clearly a growth revival is underway. Uh, stepping back for a second, uh, we saw that the NBFCs as a whole registered decadal low grade, uh, growths of 4% and 2% respectively in FY20 and FY21. Uh, uh, which uh, was impacted initially by funding access challenges post the ILFS issue. And then uh, we had the pandemic impacting them. Uh, th that uh, uh, we have seen collections improve and funding access uh, gradually increasing uh, in, in the current uh, or FI22. And we are estimating NBFC AUM to have grown around 6 to 8% in FI22. Another trend that uh, we are seeing is organic consolidation, which is happening with the larger NBFCs gaining market share. Uh, so if we look at the top uh, gray boxes, uh, the top five NBFCs share has gone up from 40% to 46% in the three years till March 21. In fact, if we exclude the top five NBFCs, the sector AUM would have actually declined in FY21. And that would have been for the first time since FY 2003. Uh, in FY23, uh, with the situation normalizing and economic activity picking up, uh, we see growth coming in higher at 8 to 10 percent. While this remains lower than the 20 percent growth we had seen pre-2018, 
uh, it is still a significant shift from uh, what we have seen in FY20 and FY21. Uh, from a segmental perspective, we see the highest growth coming in traditional segments like home loans, vehicle loans, and gold loans. Uh, segments like lab and wholesale loans are likely to remain subdued. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, now, looking at the financial health of NBFCs, uh, we've seen that amidst the challenges in recent years, uh, NBFCs have adopted a three-pronged strategy, which I refer to as the LPC framework. Uh, that is enhancing liquidity buffers, uh, provisioning cover, and the capitalization levels. So in the left chart here, we have shown how the liquidity cover is trending for NBFCs. Uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, nearly a quarter of our rated NBFCs had a liquidity cover of less than 1x over a three-month time frame on their debt repayment obligations. However, that has improved over time. And as per our more recent analysis, only 3% of our rated NBFCs have a liquidity cover of less than 1x. And these are mainly the better rated ones uh, with uh, good collections and uh, fundraising and refinancing ability. Now, on the top right chart, we see that NBFCs uh, have uh, improved their capitalization uh, side also. Uh, more than 60,000 crore of equity has been raised in the last two and a half years. And this has brought their leverage levels down, especially given their subdued growth. And in the bottom right chart, we see that provision uh, cover levels have also improved for NBFCs uh, in various segments over time. So these measures should hold them uh, in good stead in the days to come. Next slide, please. Uh, moving uh, to our now to our expectation on NBFC asset quality, uh, we are expecting NPAs to fall after having risen by around 150 basis points in the December quarter, and that increase was primarily uh, due to the adherence to RBI's clarification on NPA recognition, which came out in November. Uh, now, uh, this impact has been varied across segments. For instance, it was uh, quite low in gold loans, uh, while for uh, segments like vehicle financiers, we saw a higher impact of up to 500 basis points. Uh, overall, for the segment vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the uh, 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 business as usual basis, uh, the difference was 150 basis points. Uh, uh, nevertheless, asset quality metrics are expected to improve in the days to come with uh, expected improvement in macroeconomic activity, uh, which will help to steady borrower cash flows. In addition, uh, we had the RBI coming out with a circular in uh, February, uh, which allowed deferment of the implementation of the NPA upgradation norm uh, till September. And that provides uh, a reasonable transition time for NBFCs uh, to recalibrate their processes and revamp their collections infrastructure. So we are expecting NPS to come down by 150 to 200 basis points in the near term. Having said that, uh, we will need to continue to monitor the performance of the restructured book, especially in the MSME loans and the unsecured loan segments. So overall, uh, credit quality outlook remains largely stable for NBFCs with uh, macroeconomic environment normalizing from the pandemic impact and uh, NBFCs sharpening their focus on collections and uh, building buffers on liquidity, provisioning and capitalization. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now uh, coming to our uh, last slide, uh, moving on, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, so we'd like to conclude now with a quick summary. Uh, so overall, uh, credit quality outlook uh, continues to remain positive with upgrades expected to outnumber downgrades in the current fiscal 23. Uh, that uh, is on the basis of uh, expectation of sustenance of domestic demand, public expenditure for in infrastructure projects, and tailwinds on exports along with robust balance sheet strength. For banks and non-banks, we are seeing an improving business environment and strengthening balance sheets, and we have stable credit quality outlook there. Having said that, some moderation in credit ratio is expected this fiscal, as uh, persistent inflationary trends can create headwinds to demand and profitability across sectors. Also, uh, geopolitical risks due to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, uh, resulting in possible supply chain snags and rise in commodity prices will be key monitorables. Uh, on the other hand, as we say, the, uh, the COVID is down but not out as, as of now. Uh, a potential next wave of the pandemic, though not a base case expectation, uh, is also a key near-term risk, especially if a new mut mutation of the virus dilutes the protection from our vaccination drive and uh, if that leads to extensive lockdowns. 
Uh, and on that note, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I now request Rama to take over proceedings as we move to the Q&A session. Over to you, Rama. Thank you, Krishan and Som, for an insightful presentation. Uh, before we move to our next segment, I would like to announce that Crystal Ratings has recently launched a mobile application called Ratings Analytica and a portal ratingsanalytica.com to offer high-quality, timely, and actionable insights by combining data, domain expertise, and decades of institutional experience. We have been receiving several requests from the audience for webinar presentations. I would like to inform that even a presentation for today's webinar will be available on our mobile app as well as portal in the next few days. You may also download the mobile app by scanning the QR codes visible on your screen. Before moving to the Q&A session, we would be running a poll to know the participants' view on some of the topical themes. Request everyone to please share your responses. We would also be announcing the results live. So let's begin uh, with our first question. Yeah, uh, what is your expectation of credit ratio, uh, which is ratio of upgrades to downgrades for fiscal 2023? The choices as you see on the screen uh, will remain high at current levels, will be moderate, will be low. Let's see the results. We'll request you all to please respond with your choices here. Okay, so we see results coming in. Um, I think um, it's more or less uh, divided, but with a larger proportion, around 53% of the audience believe that it will remain moderate, while 45% of the audience uh, believe that the credit ratio will remain high at current levels. Thank you for your response on this question. Moving on to the second one. Do you expect corporate deleveraging trend to continue? Request you to choose your answer between a yes and a no. We wait for your responses. Um, I think here uh, the majority uh, goes with a yes, uh, where uh, the audience believe that uh, the corporate deleveraging trend is expected to continue, while 39% have selected a no. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, what is your expectation on private cap capex for fiscal 2023? Uh, is it likely to grow significantly, grow moderately, or remain muted? We see the responses coming in. Okay, so we have a results here. I think more than around 61% of the audience believe uh, that the Private CapEx for 23 will grow moderately, while we have 27% calling out that it will grow significantly and 12% believe that it will remain muted. Okay, so we have last one uh, for this webinar. Uh, what is your expectation on bank credit growth for fiscal 2023? There are four options here, greater than 12%, 10 to 12%, 8 to 10%, and less than 8%. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think we, we await the final outcome of the poll on this one. I think here again, uh, around 55%, the majority believe that the bank credit growth is expected to be between 10 to 12% for fiscal 2023, while 25% of the audience believe it is between 8 to 10%, and 15% uh, is greater than 12% is what the expectation is. Great. So thank you all for participating in these poll questions. So we all now move to the Q&A session. Uh, for this session, we also have with us Anut Sethi, Manish Gupta, and Mohit Makija, Senior Directors, Crystal Rating, joining us. You will be able to see a Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, please type your question there along with your company name and await for your turn. Participants are requested to refrain from asking company-specific questions. I would now request Subodh to take up the proceedings of the Q&A session. Over to you, Subodh. Thank you, Rama, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So just looking at the answers uh, of a question, and I must say most of the participants are reasonably bullish, whether it is credit outlook, whether it is private capex, deleveraging, I think, or credit ratio, I think uh, most of the participants are positive. So are we. We also believe that uh, credit ratio will remain above one and you know upgrades will outnumber the downgrades so all right moving on to the question and answer sessions uh, so we have first question from mr swarn agarwal and his question is why is power discom very strong both in terms of bs and oc of strength so i will request manish gupta to take up this question please Oh, sure. Thanks, uh, Subodh. And uh, thanks, Swan, for this question. Uh, so, Swan, uh, the bubble that you saw on the chart, uh, that was pertaining to private sector uh, discounts. And uh, here you may see that uh, given their regulated business models and the growing power demand, we see a very strong cash flows uh, growth sustaining over there. So that is one part. And the other thing is that uh, given that uh, over the last few years, we have seen a very balanced tariff regimes in their service area. So we have seen the debt levels have also come down uh, over the years. So this has provided a strong uh, balance sheet cushion too. So I must repeat that this does not include the state discounts as these are not uh, rated by us. So, so that is uh, how it is. Thank you, Manish. Uh, now we move to the second question. This question has come from Swapna Sarip. And this pertains to one of the theme we have been discussing in our presentation. It is about Ukraine and Russia war. And the question is that expectation of Ukraine and Russia war. So I'm assuming that the question essentially pertains to the likely impact of Ukraine and Russia war. So Manish, you may want to take this question, please. Yeah, so uh, see, uh, Ukraine and Russia war uh, has has uh, definitely led to increase in uh, uh, some of the commodity prices. Second, I think from a supply chain perspective also, there have been some sectors which have been uh, impacted uh, uh, over here. Like, for instance, I mean, uh, edible oil, uh, sunflower oil, etc., which is uh, largely imported and a good proportion is imported from Ukraine. So that uh, has, has seen some kind of an impact. Similarly, I mean, if you look at uh, the commodity prices, uh, oil, crude oil in particular, that uh, has shot up. It went up to as high as uh, $130 and currently settling around uh, $110 uh, or so. So this, again, uh, will have an impact on multiple sectors. Uh, the downstream sectors are going to be impacted uh, uh, for sure, where uh, the, the crude linked uh, derivatives are uh, the key raw materials there. Similarly, from a logistic perspective, also uh, the, the logistic heavy sectors are also going to be impacted as we've already begun seeing uh, increase in the petrol and diesel prices uh, that has been happening over the last uh, few weeks or so, you know, on a very consistent basis. So, so that is something uh, which is going to impact uh, uh, some of these uh, downstream sectors. Oil marketing companies, while I mean, definitely they are increasing uh, the prices, but I think uh, uh, there may still be some bit of an under recovery uh, is what we uh, uh, see for sure. So there again will be some kind of a margin impact. Uh, so broadly on a corporate side, I mean, this is what we are seeing. Uh, a, a key monitorable over here definitely will be how long uh, the war uh, uh, prevails and uh, 
the the way i think uh, things may cool down i mean that's something uh, that that uh, uh, will be a monitorable we are expecting that uh, this may last for a couple of quarter as of now but uh, uh, and subsequently cool down so that is uh, what we are broadly expecting uh, the way uh, we see it right now all right manish thanks a lot and the next question is on financial sector so this question is from uh, harish nair and the question is can you please provide nbfc segmental collection efficiencies for vehicle microfinance gold and housing finance segments so krishnan you may want to take up this question please uh, sure so thanks uh, harish for the question uh, so across uh, nbfc segments uh, we had seen a dip in collections in the first wave of the pandemic and the second wave of the pandemic the dip in the second wave of the pandemic was lower than in the first but uh, from uh, july august uh, t- uh, 21 onwards we have seen an improvement in the collection efficiencies across segments so when we look at uh, q4 uh, we have seen uh, the gold and housing finance segments which hitherto also the impact was lower the collection efficiencies are around 100% vehicle finance are at around 9900% 9, some cases uh, because of overdue collections it's above 100% as well on microfinance uh, we have seen again steady improvement it's upwards of 98% for uh, most players so uh, in general the trend is that of uh, improving co- collection efficiencies and uh, that's something we expect to uh, continue going forward over to you subo thank you krishna and this is one more question for you krishnan and this one is on banking sector sure on credit quality so this question is from heman sultania and uh, it reads my question is regarding the banking sector asset quality we have seen restructured advances of 2.5% as on december 2021 how do we expect this to move into npa category once moratorium goes over yes Uh, so uh, hemant uh, this two and a half percent restructuring is across uh, various uh, segments and the highest uh, contribution is from the msme category uh, which is around uh, where it is around 6% so what we do expect is there will be higher degree of slippages in the msme segment where we mentioned in the presentation that npas may go up by around 250 uh, odd basis points in the msme segment uh, but uh, on the corporate side the uh, extent of restructuring is quite low and we expect the improvement uh, in npas uh, to continue and npas to come down to around 3.2 to 3.4% by uh, march uh, 23 uh, and and that will uh, because corporate is the single largest constituent of credit at around 40% that will uh, result in overall uh, npas uh, coming down so the, that's broadly the sense the other angle that we need to keep in mind is the restructuring this time around Uh, post pandemic uh, there is a uh, structurally it is different from the restructuring that we had seen uh, if you go back to post uh, the global financial crisis from 2009 to 2015 there uh, we had uh, schemes like s4a and so on practically a, a, a large proportion of those restructured accounts slipped into npas from 2016 this time around we are not expecting that because a bulk a lot of these restructured assets have come because of pandemic related issues not due to permanent uh, credit profile improvement yes uh, deterioration yes some uh, accounts would be because of that but uh, in a lot of accounts uh, once the situation normalizes their uh, operating landscape business operations would uh, stabilize and they should come back to normalcy so we 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 are expecting slippages but more on the msme side over, over to you subodh thank you thank you krishna and the next question is from uh, vaibhavi kamat and uh, you know the question is that what will the impact of expected liquidity withdrawal and interest rate hurdle on the credit profile of the companies particularly nbfcs vaibhavi is from uti mutual fund so what i'll do i'll try to attempt the first part and press no sure. after that you can chip in for nbfcs so uh, if you som has already given the presentation where he has clearly shown that the balance sheet of corporate india has become very strong and if you look at the leverage uh, you know leverage has gone down sharply over the last 5 years for consolidated portfolio it used to be around one times now it is down to 0.55 times and if you look at interest cover it used to be somewhere closer to three times now it is has exceeded four times so i believe there is fair bit of question and that therefore an jump in interest i won't say jump but increase in interest rate may not directly impact the credit profile immediately and uh, 
Krishnan, you can take up the question for NBFC. Sure, sure. So what we have seen uh, in the last, uh, say, two and a half to three years, NBFCs have uh, built up uh, uh, on balance sheet liquidity. And today it looks much better than what it was uh, two years back. If you look at NBFCs liquidity uh, available on their balance sheet. So uh, they, they have a cushion within their balance sheet to continue business operations uh, if the, the interest rate environment turns very adverse. Uh, at the same time, they will also have the flexibility to actually raise uh, uh, interest rates uh, on their loans uh, to their customers. So that's a flexibility they will have. The other thing which also we need to keep in mind, today a bulk of NBFC's borrowings is coming from the banking system rather than from the debt capital markets. So what happens is the debt capital market borrowings are more sensitive to interest rates as compared to bank borrowings. So uh, the, the, we, we are not expecting an immediate significant hardening in bank borrowing costs. Yes, there may be some increase there, but not a very sharp increase. So that uh, so the overall weighted average cost of borrowings uh, of NPFC should not increase much. Plus, they will have the flexibility to pass on their rates. Plus, they have inbuilt, as of now, on balance sheet liquidity. So all this put together should mean that the impact on credit profile of NBFCs should not be very material. Over to you, Sumo. Thank you, Krishna. And here is a macro level question, Som. And this question is from Mr. Pawan Kumar. It is about private capex. So his question is, What's the outlook on private capex from your end? What sense of capacity utilization on manufacturing side? And are you, are we seeing any supply side issues? How about you, Song? Sure. Sure. So good. Thanks. Uh, so in terms of the private capex, as we outlined in our presentation, uh, we do uh, anticipate, uh, you know, pick up in private capex, but in some pockets. For example, on the infrastructure side, given the huge amount of thrust from the government, uh, in terms of the various uh, sectors. So we are seeing the infrastructure linked sectors such as steel and cement. Uh, we are anticipating some degree of capex to happen. Uh, also, uh, on the, on the PLI side as well, there are, uh, you know, some, some pockets of, uh, uh, the corporate side where, where we do anticipate, uh, capex to happen. But having said that, this is only in, in some pockets. It is not going to be very broad based or widespread in terms of capex. So uh, still, if you look at the overall capacity utilization in the manufacturing uh, sector, it is still, you know, uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70 percent kind of level, and much lower than what what typically uh, corporates would want to uh, see before before opening their first strings and then trying to expand their uh, capacities. So for for a vast majority of the sectors, we do anticipate, you know, only regular or maintenance kind of capex and not not. Uh, uh, large uh, large scale expansions, uh, but for some of the pockets that uh, I kind of outlined. Maybe suppose if you want to add anything, uh, please feel free. No, this, this pretty much covers everything uh, on private capex side. So thank you. So moving on, uh, the next question is from uh, Awadhani Venkat, and this is an interesting one, Krishna. Okay, this is yeah. you. It says that deleveraging and credit growth are opposite terms. So this is one side debt is going down and credit growth is the other one. So do you think it is possible to have credit growth and corporate deal everything? Sure. I think a good question, a very conceptual first principles question. Uh, Abdani, thank you very much for that. Uh, see, historically, if you look at this is what has happened in the last few years. If you see a credit bank credit growth has always been positive last few years, still corporate deleveraging has happened. So very fundamentally, it is a debt by equity. Uh, so if uh, overall borrowings go up, it is, uh, it, it, uh, it also, uh, you have to factor in the net worth going up, profitability, you have to see the EBITDA levels coming in. So if you look at uh, last year or so, EBITDA levels have actually strengthened for uh, many companies. So that has helped uh, with the internal accruals. Equity raises have happened, as Som also pointed out. A number of companies have uh, done equity raises. So that also contributes to uh, leverage uh, levels uh, uh, coming down. Uh, going forward as well, <clears throat> only if the re- pace of borrowing exceeds the pace of uh, capital accretion, that is when the leverage level uh, will go up. So uh, we, we don't uh, expect that to happen unless the credit growth or the borrowing uh, kind of trajectory is significantly higher than what we have uh, projected. So at this current level of uh, uh, bank credit growth, uh, we are not expecting uh, the leverage levels to go up too much. Over to you, Subodh. Thank you, Krishna. 
and uh, we have next question from mr ansal and this question will be for you anuj and the question is that with the reference to the bubble chart what is negative impact on agrochemical sector yeah it is largely a uh, supply side constraint uh, with respect to the inputs uh, which has got exacerbated by the russia ukraine conflict as well as some of the supply disruptions which we saw on the china front uh, uh, because of you know covid spreading there and also uh, frequent shutdowns which have happened in the third and fourth quarters so it is largely uh, related to that which has pushed the commodity prices up and that will impact uh, uh, the agricultural sector of course here we also include fertilizers uh, and we expect that in fertilizers they will obviously become more costlier but then uh, we also expect the subsidy uh, to come in from the government uh, though that will be with a lag thank you anuj yeah. and uh, here is a question from uh, dhananjay and uh, the question is that if any wave of covid like in china now will it change this current just give me a moment will it will this will it change this current positive outlook change any quantitative impact possible so so maybe i'll start and you can chip in sure. so uh, as we have said that we are expecting some moderation in the credit ratio that we saw in the you know in the second half of the last fiscal because of multiple region and any very intense covid wave will definitely be downside risk to our outlook but there are many moving parts you know one if a covid wave comes how severe it is how long will it last how many regions will be impacted how the government will react whether the restrictions will be localized or not multiple you know moving parts are there so uh, you know as and when it happens we will kind of factor in its impact uh, but definitely if there's a big wave while well, i'm not saying it's china like because china actually deals with waves in a very different manner but if there is a wave as and when it happens we will definitely look at it and we'll see that what kind of impact it can have on the outlook so yeah yes sir uh, so uh, in terms of what we have also seen over the last two years i think we have now uh, learned how to live with the virus um, and and if you look at even the the responses from the government side they have been far much more measured calibrated uh, while the first wave saw uh, a intense nationwide kind of a lockdown the second and third uh, wave uh, saw so much much uh, lesser uh, impact in terms of economic activity the the, the restrictions were fair, fairly localized and and uh, did not impact the economic uh, activity and the third wave was actually uh, you know very very less in terms of uh, any any kind of disruption uh, so uh, i think uh, over a span of time when we we believe that uh, the government's response also is likely to be you know more more calibrated more localized kind of a thing rather than very widespread having said that uh, i think the caveat will always be that you know covid is down but not out so any any uh any variant which which could escape the vaccine which could cause a lot of hospitalizations or uh be more fatal i think uh, probably the response could be different at this juncture we are not anticipating that uh and hence uh, you know we we are not factoring that uh, uh into into our outlook per se but it could be one of the monitorables thank you so much and the next question is from uh, prasanna sorpuria so there are two parts in the question first part is around private capex so which we have largely addressed maybe we can go to the second part and the second part of the question reads that fmcg and two wheeler companies are seeing low volume growth despite three seasons of good monsoon and msp what is ailing rural demand and what could help recover it so anuj you may want to take this question please yeah. see one thing common between both fmcg uh, products and two wheeler is that uh, the price of both are uh, actually gone up uh, quite sharply and if you would look at two wheelers in particular if i compare it from where we were in 2019 uh, to 2022 at the entry level itself there's been a almost 35 to 40% increase in the cost of two wheeler uh, out of which about 10 to 12% would have happened in 21 22 itself and uh, if i look at the uh, if i go move on to the executive segment it would be 45 to 50% increase in the price of the vehicle itself and at the same time the fuel prices also have gone up so somewhere this is playing a part in uh, impacting two wheeler sales uh, especially on the rural side 
The other aspect is also uh, the service intensive sectors, uh, uh, you know, have been the last to recover uh, in the COVID wave. And somewhere this has impact the, impacted the income levels of people who work in this intense, uh, you know, service intensive sector, especially on the hotels, restaurants, uh, and say even at the multiplexes, etc. And these are people who also send money back you know, home into the rural areas. So the income levels there clearly have been impacted. Uh, at the same time, while MSP, etc. has been increased, rural incomes also have not increased very sharply uh, last year. So all this has played a part, you know, in impacting the demand for uh, two-wheelers on the rural side. On the FMCG side, uh, besides the price, I think there has been a lot of down trading also which has happened uh, and which has benefited the unorganized segment as uh, prices have gone up. So you will see the volumes uh, directly getting impacted for organized FMCG players. And sometimes to maintain price points also, they have reduced the damages, which has again affected volumes. Okay, thank you, Anuj. And moving on to the next question, this one is from Rahul Chobdar. And this question is for you, Krishnan, that what is the growth outlook for a smaller bank and a small finance bank considering that larger banks are using inorganic paths to grow coupled with aggressive lending to gain market share? Sure. So, uh, thanks, uh, Rahul, for that uh, question. So the way we are looking at it is uh, uh, each bank will have its own uh, dynamic that we will have to look into. A uh, number of uh, small uh, banks, uh, uh, they, they have their own niche segments. And because of the smaller base and size, they can grow faster. That applies for some of the small finance banks also. At the other hand, there are uh, some, some of these smaller banks who are on the borderline as far as uh, capital adequacy is concerned. So they would actually need uh, to mobilize uh, capital and uh, look at uh, the growth. Also, some of the smaller banks who have uh, kind of focused on the SME segment have seen an increase in the NPA segment. So they are expected uh, uh, to be to be cautious. Uh, uh, overall, if I look at the small finance bank segment, I still expect to, uh, to see a growth in line with the credit growth uh, projections that we have articulated for the system. It is the larger private banks which will grow faster and the public sector bank overall growth will be somewhat lower than the overall average that we have talked about the small finance banks would be somewhere in that range whereas the uh, the private older private sector banks which are which form the bulk of the smaller banks their growth overall may be lower than the number which we have uh, pointed out and uh, the bottom line is it will vary from uh, bank to bank different banks are having different dynamics and uh, uh, the uh, business focus so it will depend on that over to you Subo. thank you krishnan and in fact there's one more question for you and this pertains to recent merger of sdfc and sdfc bank so this question is from uh, suresh and his question is whether HDFC and HDFC bank merger is likely to accelerate consolidation within BFSI. Sure. So I, I wouldn't say that this would be a trigger. Uh, consolidation within the BFSI segment, Anil, has been happening for uh, some time. Uh, you may recall the SBI merger with all its associate banks. We had Bank of Baroda merging with Dena and Vijaya Bank. Subsequent to that, we have 10 public sector banks merging into four. So uh, it has been happening uh, over time. We've had, uh, we have seen uh, BFSI uh, sector uh, segment mergers happening in the insurance space. You've seen that happening in the NBFC space. Uh, even before the HDFC, HDFC bank announcement, we had Axis Bank taking up the consumer finance business of City. So this has been happening over time, clearly uh, defined by uh, potential for credit growth growth and the business focus areas and uh, people with uh, good pockets and good access to capital, uh, they would be looking to focus more and uh, inorganic pathway uh, does uh, provide a greater uh, kind of opportunity to immediately uh, grow your balance sheet. So we do expect uh, uh, the inorganic uh, tendencies to continue uh, in, in the uh, financial uh, sector and uh, some of the smaller entities in uh, both banking side as well as the NBFC side could be uh, potential uh, targets. Access to funding from the private equity players is also uh, one of the key elements which can uh, support this trend. So overall, I think uh, uh, the consolidation part is uh, going to continue. Over to you, Subodh. Thank you, Krishnan. And there's another interesting question on MFI's collection. 
So this question is uh, from Prasanna Surpuriya. And the question is, why there is a contrast in collection efficiencies for MFI companies and demand for stipples and two-wheelers? So all yours, Krishna. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, on the uh, MFI uh, side, I, I, I'm just try revisiting the question because you are comparing the collection efficiencies. I'm assuming that it is comparison of collection efficiency between MFIs and say two wheelers. So the, the way we, we are looking at it is MFI, there was a higher dip in collection efficiencies during uh, the both waves of the pandemic, a higher dip in the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, in the first wave of the pandemic, MFI collections was pretty much equal to zero. Uh, or with low single digits, uh, because most of those uh, borrowers uh, took the moratorium and there was uh, no payment. It was uh, kind of an opt uh, uh, in kind of a situation. So unless you opted in to pay collections, you actually took the moratorium. So there was hardly any collections. And in the MFI segment, what happens is if you don't pay for say three to four installments, it becomes very difficult to regularize uh, in one go because uh, those customers are uh, financially vulnerable and uh, they, will, they, they don't have the enough savings to pay three or four installments at one go. So once you fall into uh, deeper buckets of delinquencies, you tend to remain there for some time. You may pay one or two additional installments, but not too many at one go. So MFI, while uh, MFI, the uh, incremental collection efficiency have, has, has picked up, as I said earlier, to about 98% and some entities are close to 100%. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the delinquencies of uh, uh, borrowers who have already slipped into, say, 90 plus bucket, that, come, that remains elevated. The, uh, it will take time for them to normalize or though some of those accounts will have to be written out. So we will see uh, elevated credit costs uh, there. Uh, the two-wheeler segment has uh, did, uh, does not have some of those fundamental issues that the MFI segment has. Uh, two-wheeler uh, segment collection efficiencies did uh, dip, but then uh, it it has picked up. And we have also seen uh, uh, borrow, uh, I mean, originator-wise dis, uh, 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 dispersion in terms of collection efficiencies as far as two-wheelers are concerned. Some of the uh, NDFCs have shown very good uh, two-wheeler collections uh, currently, while there are a couple, two or three entities uh, which uh, showed a greater dip in collection efficiencies and had uh, uh, wait uh, to wait for a longer time for them to come back. I would uh, kind of uh, uh, attribute that more to the organization-wide collections and local uh, geographical issues rather than uh, something to do with two-wheelers uh, as an industry segment uh, as, as a whole. So over to you, Subodh. So what, just one, one additional nuance I would want to add. Like, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, so in terms of uh, the question itself, uh, you know, when you look at staples and two-wheelers vis-a-vis uh, a, a loan repayment to an MFI, I mean, loan repayment to an MFI is more or less non-discretionary in nature because if you do not pay or continue not to pay to be reported in a, in a credit bureau, it has impact in terms of your credit profile, ability to, you know, get fresh funding. So to that extent, it is somewhat non-discretionary in nature. Whereas when you look at staples and two-wheelers, you know, it is discretionary and there is a, a possibility that people have downgraded it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, smaller packets or smaller ticket sizes, etc. And that is what probably is the expense, the contrast uh, that that uh, is being is being highlighted. Over to you, Subodh. Thanks, Om. And thanks, Krishnan. Uh, next question is from Vaibhavi Kamath, uh, UTI Mutual Fund. And this is about good prices. Okay, so it, and its impact on asset quality. So the question, Krishnan, is that how the rising crude prices and high freight rates expected <clears throat> to improve demand slash asset quality for vehicle financiers and BFCs? Sure. Uh, so uh, we, uh, the way uh, we would uh, be looking at it is that uh, underlying vehicle sales, they are expected to pick up in the current fiscal. And that uh, would actually translate into uh, demand for uh, loans as well. So uh, both uh, banks and NBFCs will benefit out of it. Uh, so far, we have been seeing a, a reasonable pickup in used vehicle sales and the new vehicle sales typically follow after that. So used vehicle sales have gone up, used vehicle portfolio sizes have uh, seen growth. So uh, we uh, the underlying fundamental economic uptick that is expected to drive sales and hence loan disbursements uh, from uh, NBFCs. Uh, also, your other question about uh, the oil price hike and freight price increases. So what we have seen historically is that freight prices increase with a lag 
once uh, oil prices go up. So, uh, uh, because uh, they, they, unless that happens, the profitability of the transporters, that takes a hit. So, w- what we have typically seen historically is that there is a time lag and after which the uh, freight price increases uh, align with the oil price increases. So, we expect that to kind of continue uh, to happen over the medium term. Uh, till that time, uh, there will be some cash flow uh, issues at, at the uh, uh, tra- transporters. Uh, but the, the, the quicker this happens, alignment, the the uh, the, uh, the more regu- the easier will the steadying of the cash flows happen. And this issue will be less for used vehicle operators as compared to new vehicle operators, uh, because that differential uh, is less in used vehicle operators. EMI sizes are also low. So what we are looking at is uh, some bit of impact on uh, collection efficiencies and delinquencies due to this in the near term. But uh, more importantly, because the uh, uh, delinquencies have already gone up uh, due to the uh, RBI circular issued in November. So the the reduction will happen largely on account of that, despite this uh, oil price and uh, freight price mismatch, at least for some time. Over to you, Subhu. Christian, thank you. And actually, there's one more question for you, Krishna. This one is from Mr. Anil on MSMEs. So his question is, can you elaborate more on MSME segment stress splitting into PSU banks and private banks and NBFCs? Sure. Also ticket size-wise. And then he kind of gave a preliminary sort of objection. I guess lower the ticket size, higher the stress. Yeah. Sure, sure. So between MS, uh, on the MSME exposures between PSU banks, private banks and NBFCs, we expect the maximum impact under PSU banks. Uh, and, uh, then we, uh, then we come to NBFCs and then private sector banks. So the reason of uh, this difference is that uh, in terms of uh, the public sector banks, historically, if you see MSME NPAs have uh, ranged in around the nine to 10 percent mark. And uh, the, the, in terms of their follow up, their collections, the way they handle those accounts, that is different from the way uh, what how private banks and uh, NBFCs uh, look at it. Uh, private banks uh, have uh, uh, put in a very, ca- uh, or I would say the, the, the number of them have put in place a very cash flow focused uh, approach towards evaluating cr- credit profiles of uh, uh, MSMEs. And many of the private sector banks also look at only the top sliver of the MSMEs. They may not go uh, very granular into the lower sized MSMEs. So the, uh, the, in terms of impact on MSMEs, uh, the top NBFCs, uh, top MSMEs have been impacted. Lower than the smaller MSMEs. So uh, that also will uh, uh, mean that the impact on private banks is lower. NBFCs, on the other hand, have a more granular approaches. They also lend to the lower sized uh, MSMEs. And at the same time, if you look at the historical track record, they have been able to manage the collections, work with the borrowers, have a life cycle approach towards lending to the MSMEs and uh, ensure that if there may be delinquencies, delinquencies 90 plus may go up. But ultimate credit losses will be controlled because of their partnership based approach in terms of collections within NBFCs. Again, I will uh, kind of make a distinction between the between the traditional NBFCs lending to MSMEs and the newer age uh, fintechs who have also been lending to MSMEs. Uh, We have seen a higher uh, uh, impact of delinquencies in the fintech portfolios because for many of them, the collection infrastructure on the ground has not uh, kind of kept up pace with their disbursements. And many of them are uh, looking at a greater focus on digital collections. Uh, At the end of the day, touch, feel, and uh, on-ground contact with customers is important to improve collection. So we are seeing a higher level of uh, delinquencies and uh, uh, the restructuring in the MSME book of many of these fintech uh, players. Uh, But at the same time, they are uh, well capitalized, uh, at least the ones rated by Crystal. They are well capitalized and should be able to uh, take on the impact of the higher delinquencies and provisioning levels. Over to you, Sukhu. Thank you, Krishnan. And uh, next question is for you, Manish. Uh, this question is from Mr. Prasanna Surpuriya, and this is about commodity prices. So his question is, are we in a commodity super cycle? How will rising commodity prices impact Indian corporate margin as we are dependent on imports for most critical inputs? Uh, uh, thanks, Subodh, and thanks, uh, Prasanna, for this question. 
So first part of your question is, uh, are we in a commodity super cycle? So answer is yes, definitely we are. I think, I don't think we have uh, seen uh, such kind of a sharp rise in most of the commodities uh, in, in uh, last several uh, years. Uh, both, I mean, if you look at from crude oil perspective or metals perspective, uh, they are running at a very, very uh, high level. Crude oil for various reasons, including Russia, Ukraine. And uh, metals, uh, uh, they, the price rise started even before uh, the war. Uh, and uh, it was largely to do with supply side constraints, ESG, uh, shutting down of uh, uh, the, the steel capacities and uh, other non ferrous capacities uh, in China, etc. So that has led to this kind of a uh, uh, commodity price. Demand, however, has remained quite uh, robust. Uh, uh, in non-ferrous, there is a transition uh, that we are seeing uh, uh, in auto sector, auto to, uh, from steel to aluminium. Uh, and some of the new age sectors uh, like uh, electric vehicles, etc., are also driving a good, good amount of demand uh, in these sectors. So hence, uh, uh, we believe that uh, the prices may remain quite uh, uh, robust, may not be at this level, but at least uh, significantly higher than uh, the decadal averages over uh, uh, next one year or so. Uh, now, having said this, I mean, the impact uh, will be felt uh, by the, the upstream, the metal companies and the oil companies definitely are going to reap the benefits, so there they will be a margin benefit for them. But from the downstream perspective, there will be some bit of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, compression uh, in margin, and that will be dependent upon how uh, the, uh, the pass-through uh, is, in, is enabled there. Some of the sectors, uh, like in auto, we have seen uh, companies uh, raising prices. But given the competitive nature, we don't see that the full pass-through will be available uh, in those sectors. Similarly, crude link sectors uh, uh, in, in uh, chemical, plastics, etc., some bit of a pass-through is definitely happening uh, over there. But yes, uh, the full uh, uh, pass-through may not be possible. Uh, cement, etc., are also uh, getting impacted because of increasing energy cost as well. So, so this this, this uh, aspect will be impacting the corporate margins, uh, at least uh, in the near near to medium term uh, for sure. Thank you, Manish. And so my next question is for you, and this pertains to the theme of uh, deleveraging in related corporate portfolio. So this question is from Mr. Paman, and the question is, uh, any efficiency, efficiency change seen in terms of working capital site? This primarily related to uh, deleveraging that we are seeing across system or is it due to lower capex spend? I think uh, clearly in terms of deleveraging, one of the things uh, and themes which has uh, played out is uh, you know waiting uh, on the fringes by the corporates for uh, fresh capex. Uh, given that the capacity utilization levels have uh, continued to trend uh, uh, on the lower side, so that is one of the primary reasons. On the working capital side, you know there have been a few uh, sectors which have actually benefited on account of uh, some of the Atmanirbhar packages uh, which were uh, announced by the government uh, over a span of time. For example, uh, you know, there has been a large amount of uh, uh, subsidy release in the fertilizer sector, which has resulted in a substantial uh, amount of correction in terms of the debt which used to be there. Uh, historically, in the fertilizer sector, there used to be a lot of subsidy buildup uh, which used to happen at the end of the year and uh, which used to get corrected over a span of time. But but over the last one to two years, we've seen that uh, government has uh, uh, corrected uh, some of those uh, past uh, uh, subsidies where some of those sectors have benefited. Um, uh, and uh, likewise, if we look at uh, some of the uh, you know power discounts, uh, uh, where again through RDC and PFC, the government has uh, uh, enabled uh, uh, funding for for clearing up of uh, uh, the the the, the buildup of receivables which happened ultimately in the Gencos. So there also we have seen uh, some degree of policy related uh, uh, support coming in and and uh, you know resulting in some working capital release in 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 a few of the sectors. But otherwise, by and large, you know, working capital uh, has has, has uh, continued to uh, remain in in line with uh, the growth which we've seen across companies. And in fact, uh, next year, uh, as as the inflationary trends are going to be fairly on the higher side, so that is likely to uh, create some degree of uh, demand for working capital. Uh, given that you would see both on the on the inventory side as well as on the receivable side, uh, uh, the impact of uh, higher uh, prices 
play out. And that uh, also will create a little bit of uh, 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 demand for credit in the banking system. Over to you, Sumo. Thank you, uh, Som. And next question, Som, is about our uh, positive outlook on credit quality. This question is from Ansu. And the question is, what could be other emerging risks that may lead to change in the current positive outlook other than CVOT of next COVID wave, which we just discussed? So clearly, I think what we've highlighted is, you know, uh, the, the inflationary uh, pressures which are there and how it impacts the demand and how it impacts uh, 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 the margins uh, for, for corporates. That would be one of the critical aspects. And uh, the, the other critical aspect is if you look at uh, at, at an overall uh, global, globally, we are seeing the central banks, uh, uh, you know, during the pandemic time, there was a fair degree of accommodative uh, monetary policies, uh, la- large amount of money which was pumped up and the interest rates which, which, have, uh, which were brought down. And now there is a reversal of that happening. So how fast uh, that happens and how it impacts the overall uh, flow of uh, money and the liquidity available in the system is also something which will determine, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the availability of liquidity and the cost of uh, funds for, for corporates, uh, uh, even in India. Uh, while while the immediate impact, like what I think, uh, you know, we, we spoke, uh, you know, a few minutes back, that given the, the lower levels of debt, uh, today the corporates are in a much better position to manage uh, interest rate uh, increases. Nevertheless, any sharp increase in interest rates uh, uh, emanating uh, from from uh, some of the some of the actions uh, outside the country could could also be uh, you know monitorable. Okay. Audience. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, as we are reaching closer to our webinar, maybe I can take one last question. So, Krishnan, this question is for you, and this is from Mr. Anil. And his question is: Will gold loans and unsecured loans from fintechs and non MFI uh, NMBFC, that's right. MFI NBFC. Yeah. Will be considered as debt for EMI calculation as percentage of income for MFI customers. Yeah, the short answer, I suppose, is uh, yes, and uh, uh, Mr. Anil uh, as well, uh, because what RBI Circular says, it is a cap on total repayment obligations of borrowers to 50% of the monthly uh, household income. So what that will uh, mean is the borrower, uh, the lenders have to do the uh, comprehensive credit uh, evaluation of the borrowers, look at all their loans, look at all the uh, repayments and not just their microfinance loans. So this actually is intended to address concerns of over indebtedness of borrowers of MFIs, which has been an issue from a socio-political perspective also. So that's something uh, which uh, the answer is uh, yes. And the role of credit information companies and bureaus will be important here to ensure that this information is available on a timely and accurate basis. Uh, over to you, Subodh. Thank you very much, uh, Krishnan. And uh, Rama, you may want to take over now. Yes, yeah, Subodh. Um, thank you for an engaging session. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to inform that our feedback poll will shortly be visible on your screens. I uh, request you to share your feedback by selecting the appropriate option. The poll will be live for about 30 seconds. Also, in case if you have any further questions, please uh, write in to us uh, at events at crystal.com. On behalf of Crystal Ratings, I convey our sincere thanks to all of you for taking part in today's webinar. We hope that you found today's discussion insightful and timely. We also hope that your queries have been answered satisfactorily. With this, we conclude today's webinar and look forward to connecting with you in our next Crystal webinar on real estate sector titled Post-Pandemic Reality, which is scheduled on April 12th. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.